Thank you. Uh, the final item of business is the Member's Business Debate on Motion 3062 in the name of David Torrance on MS Awareness Week 2022. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put, and I would ask those members who wish to speak in the debate to please press the request to speak buttons, and I call on David Torrance. Up to seven minutes, please, Mr Torrance. Thank you, President Officer. I would like to thank my colleagues for giving their support to the motion and to those who are speaking this evening. I would also like to recognise the contribution of my colleague George Arden in hosting this debate over many years that have preceded. Presiding officer, I can guarantee that there will be no mention of Paisley in my speech tonight. <laughs> this year, MS Awareness Week runs from the 25th of April to the 1st of May. The week provides an opportunity to shine a light on what is often an invisible and misunderstood condition, currently affecting more than 900 people in Fife and 15,000 across Scotland. MS is a long-lasting disease that can affect the brain, spinal cord and optic nerve. It can cause problems with vision, balance, muscle control and other basic bodily functions. Not every MS patient is affected by a condition in the same way. In reality, symptoms experienced by an individual can often fluctuate on a day-to-day -day basis. The fact is that effects are very often different for everyone who has the condition. With some people experiencing mild symptoms which do not require treatment, while others will have trouble getting around doing daily simple tasks. For some symptoms can worsen with time, and living with MS can affect many aspects of daily life, including health, wellness, relationships and careers. A diagnosis of MS means that people may have to adapt a new lifestyle, which brings us to the theme of this year's Awareness Week, uncertainty. Uncertainty is one of the hardest parts of any progressive and unpredictable disease. Even though the symptoms themselves may be manageable, not knowing what the future holds makes it impossible to plan work and social activities. Everyone affected by a condition struggles with unpredictability of MS, but it is clear that some people find it particularly hard to accept. MS can be difficult to deal with, and the circumstances that surround the diagnosis can make people feel many different emotions, often putting great strain on relationships with friends, families and loved ones. Some studies have shown that the rate of divorce is high in families where one partner is suffering from MS, with a change in dynamics from partner or lover to carer, often taking its toll on relationships. The unpredictability of, of when MS symptoms will strike can lead to strain on any relationship due to development dependency on a healthy partner. The impact of a chronic illness such as MS on education and employment can also have a profound effect. Missed deadlines, absences, disruptions and failures to complete studies can result in students having to manage their expectations of what they are able to achieve and the settings and setting the bars lower to accommodate their illness and associated limitations. For those in employment, there are often some barriers that no level of support can negate. In Fife, these barriers have been recognised and addressed by Fife branch of Multiple Sorrows Society. Together with Fife College, they have set up a scholarship to support people with MS while we study or retrain. One important aspect of a scholarship, which sets its apart from many other avenues of financial support, is that it can be used for anything which helps people with MS cope with living with the uncertainty of their condition. For example, if they wake up one morning too tired to take the bus to college, they will be able to afford a taxi. Progressive initiatives such as these are vital and are just one reason why support groups are so important, because MS varies considerably from person to person, and the severity and the course of the disease. The value of talking and connecting with people who truly understand and are facing similar experiences and challenges as you is priceless. The emotional and social support offered through these groups can quite literally be a lifesaver. For many people, it can be their only means of socialising. For others, it is an opportunity to discuss with peers subjects which they simply would not discuss with anyone else, even their GP. For example, sexual dysfunction can be common in people with MS, but many lack the confidence to broach the subject with health care providers, preferring instead to discuss the subject with peers that they trust and feel more comfortable with. I do not believe this is a reflection on our health or social care profession, but rather a recognition that different conditions and environments help people to open up and express their concerns. But is it just medical or social uncertainty that makes life with MS difficult? As a consequence, financial uncertainties almost go hand in hand with a condition. The replacement of personal independent payment in Scotland with the adult disability payment has been welcomed by many people I have spoken with, with particular praise given to a commitment the Scottish Government to treating people with dignity, fairness and respect, 
by ensuring a very different delivery of disability benefit. I believe many important and significant lessons have been learned from the PIP model, which caused anxiety in many claimants and told stress and anxiety over the years. Only a few days ago, I sat and listened in horror to one of the ladies living with MS told me of her experience of undergoing these assessments. She described the process as cruel, tiring and ineffective, particularly for anyone with a neurological condition such as MS. She recalled the last assess assessment she attended when she witnessed a gentleman leaving the centre in a highly emotional state who then simply sat in his car sobbing. I very much welcome the Scottish Government's approach, which will see the scrapping of the functional assessments, removal of the routine face-to-face -face assessments, recognitions given to people's individual needs and understanding that fluctuating conditions must be taken into account and a choice of how to apply offered. For people with MS navigating the mentally draining transition from who you were to who you now are is traumatic enough without the additional ordeal of an uncaring benefit system. For many, it will be their first time on benefits, forced out of employment by a body that no longer can do the things it used to. I currently sit on the Citizens' Participation and Public Petitions Committee, and I am pleased to have contrib contributed to ongoing work regarding the petition lodged by Keith Park on behalf of MS Society, which calls on the Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to remove the 20 metres rule from the proposed adult disability payment eligibility criteria or identify an alternative form of support for people with mobility needs. The petition notes that under the rule, people who can walk one step over 20 metres are not qualifying for this right level of mobility support, leading to people with MS losing their independence, leaving some feeling trapped in their homes. As a committee, we have considered numerous submissions so far and engaged with a number of organisations, including MS Scotland and the Scottish Government. It is clear an issue that is felt deeply by many people living with just not MS, but with neurological conditions. I welcome the Scottish Government's commitment that facilitating an independent review of adult disability payment in 2023, one year after the delivery has begun, which it believes will enable all the eligible criteria to be considered. In conclusion, President Officer, as one very astute lady recently told me, if you see a person with MS, then they are having a good day, because when you are having a bad day, you just won't see them at all. So I would like to extend many thanks to everyone that has come along and joined us in the gallery today, because, because collectively we all have a duty to better understand the negative effects of fatigue, cognitive impairment, emotional burden and decreased physical function on a personal and professional life of people living with multiple sclerosis, and the responsibility to help those burdens in whatever way we can, not just during Awareness Week, but all year round. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Torrance. And uh, I would just gently uh, remind members uh, who are joining us in the gallery, uh, members of the public, and it's great to see you all there. Uh, we're not really allowed to clap from the gallery, but uh, thank you. Um, I would like now to call Marie McNair uh, to be followed by Donald Cameron. Up to four minutes, please, Ms McNair. Thank you, President Officer. Can I actually David Torrance, MSP, for securing this important members' debate? I pay tribute to MS Society Scotland for everything they do in supporting those with MS and their work to raise awareness. MS is unpredictable and different for everyone, which is why the theme of this week's MS Awareness Week is uncertainty. Multiple sclerosis is a chronic condition that affects your brain and spinal cord, with MS the coating that protects your nerves, myelin is, is damaged. This causes a range of symptoms and problems with how we move, think and feel. In MS, your immune system which normally helps to fight off infections, mistakes myelin for a foreign body and attacks it. This damages the myelin and strips off the nerve fibres, either slightly or completely, leaving scars known as lesions or plaques. This leads to damage and disrupts sorry, members' messages travelling along nerve fibres, causing them to slow down, become distorted or not get through at all. As well as losing myelin, there can be sometimes be damage to the actual nerve fibres too. It's this nerve damage that causes the increase in disability that can cause and occur over time. One of my constituents recently described MS to me, and she describes it as this. If you imagine the brain as a big mass of intricate wires that operate the whole body, MS causes the protective sheath around each uh, wire to deteriorate so the wires don't function properly. 
But because the brain is amazing, it tries to still find a way to send the signals in other ways, sometimes crossing the wires. That's why folk with MS often battle with fatigue, because just walking and talking can seem like trying to juggle while treading through a snow, snow drift, or like trying to do complex uh, calculus uh, while reciting the alphabet backwards. It is hard to pinpoint the exact symptoms of MS, as it can be different for everyone affected. However, the central nervous system links everything your body does, so multiple sclerosis can cause many different types of symptoms. The specific symptoms that appear depend on which part of your central nervous system has been affected and the job of the damaged nerve. Some of the most common symptoms of multiple sclerosis include eye problems, numbness, uh, tingling feelings sometimes described to be a bit like pins and needles, fatigue and pain. MS symptoms can come and go and change over time. They can be mild or more severe. The symptoms of MS are caused by your immune system attacking the nerves in your brain or spinal cord by mistake. And these nerves control a lot of different parts of your body. That's why you can get MS symptoms in many parts of your body and why everyone's MS is different. Scotland has uh, one of the highest rates of MS in the world, around 15 1,750 people are living with MS in Scotland. The new figure means that, according to MS Society Scotland, one in 300 people in Scotland are living with a potentially disabling condition which damages the body's nerves and makes it harder for people to do things such as walking, talking, eating and thinking. Initiatives by the Scottish Government have contributed to an environment that is conducive to research in MS. For example, the Scottish Government has made it compulsory that anyone diagnosed with MS is contacted by a specialist nurse with, with 10 days. There is also a national register for people diagnosed with MS. It is important to keep raising awareness about MS in Scotland, particularly given the high rates of the condition. Research has come on massively in recent years, and more people know the better. It is paramount that we raise awareness to make sure people know how MS can affect individuals and how varied it can be. In conclusion, I put on record my thanks to my constituents for sharing their experience in contributing to my real-life knowledge of this condition. I am honoured to be their voice in this debate and welcome this opportunity to help raise awareness. Thank you. Thank you, Ms McNair. And I now call Donald Cameron to be followed by Claire Adamson. Up to four minutes, please, Mr Cameron. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I begin by expressing my thanks to David Torrance for securing time for this important uh, debate. And I also would like to pay tribute to the MS Society Scotland for the support that it has provided um, both for this debate but also as Secretariat of the Cross-Party Group on MS and the important work it does in supporting people living with MS. And I know there are many in the gallery tonight. Uh, David Torrance and I have the honour of being co-conveners of that CPG and I am very pleased that it has begun this session of Parliament with such energy and enthusiasm. And I also can't let this moment go without mentioning the incredible shift that George Adam put in on behalf of that CPG uh, over the years. I spoke in this same debate in 2017, and much has changed in the last five years, with a variety of new treatments uh, approved by the Scottish Medicines Consortium, both for active relapsing, remitting MS, and for primary progressive MS. Last year, Scotland was the first country in the UK to approve the use of Zaposia, a drug which allows recipients to take it at home, thereby avoiding clinical appointments, something which will have been particularly beneficial during the pandemic. All of these developments in the way that MS is treated and managed have only come about in recent years because of the continued and sustained focus on MS at many levels. And we try our best here in Parliament to keep the pressure on, but the work of third, part, third sector organisations, health professionals across the NHS, and of course, the actions of the wider public deserve to be commended. It is of course a far cry from just over 20 years ago before this Parliament existed when there were no treatments available for MS in Scotland, as the motion notes. Uh, David Torrance spoke movingly of the toll that MS can have on people in their everyday lives. There are massive human costs. I have personally witnessed the development of MS treatments from the perspective of my father, who has lived with the condition for 37 years. He was diagnosed in the mid-1980s when knowledge of the condition and how it would impact his life in the long run was still relatively unknown. And as ever, I pay tribute to him and his example and his courage. Fortunately, he has received impeccable care and new treatments have helped him and countless others cope with MS and allow them to live full 
and happy lives. Indeed, it is welcome that in 2022, there are some 17 disease modifying therapies available to people living with MS, which help minimize the severity and frequency of MS relapses, thus slowing the progression of the disease. But as I know, and as is the theme of this year's campaign, MS is a condition wrought with uncertainty. Uncertainty about what lies ahead. Uncertainty about when it may flare up. Uncertainty about how much worse the condition may become and how best to care for someone with MS in those circumstances. That uncertainty has, of course, been amplified during the pandemic, particularly because of the vulnerability of those living with MS as a result of having a weakened immune system and the inability to access vital services, including physiotherapy, mental health support, and even sports classes. And even though we are two years into the pandemic and many services have evolved to allow people to access them remotely, including virtual appointments and virtual counseling, we know that COVID remains active and many people remain understandably worried about it. As the NHS begins to reopen and remobilize, it's more important than ever that people living with MS and crucially those who show symptoms of MS are able to access services swiftly. That's why it was concerning that the remobilization of neurological services was not specifically addressed in the Scottish Government's NHS Recovery Plan 2021. And I do hope the Minister may be able to touch on that point uh, in her remarks uh, when she closes. I also want to touch on the importance of high quality palliative care in supporting people with MS. Deputy Presiding Officer, the progress that has been made in recent years to improve treatment options for people living with MS has been remarkable. And everyone in the MS community who's campaigned for it and made it happen should be congratulated. But more, much more needs to be done to improve access to specialist care and support and to remove some of the uncertainties that presently exist. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Cameron. I now call Claire Adamson to be followed by Pam Duncan Glancy. Up to four minutes, please, Ms Adamson. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Can I too thank David Torrens for securing this debate this evening and also send my thanks to the Cross Party Group on uh, MS, um, many of whom are in the gallery and we have both the con conveners here with us um, this evening. Um, and I want particularly to pay tribute to the person who has done most to raise awareness of MS in the Parliament, and I don't mean my esteemed colleague George Adam, I mean of course Stacey, who is also in the gallery this evening. And I want to thank her just for being our Stacey. This is not the first MS debate that I have spoken in the Parliament. In fact, I, I think I, I may have spoken it in every one. Uh, and they have been a feature since I was elected in 2011. Um, and both George and David now continuing that, um, that tradition of having this debate is so important. Um, and I'm always struck by the personal stories of my colleagues on these evenings to know just how many of us are personally touched by this condition. And really that is no surprise because we know Scotland has the highest rate of MS in the world and uh, with more than 15,000 people living with the condition. And for that reason, um, I, I want to share my story as well this evening. I'm no exception. Um, I want to say a little bit about my sister, my big sister. She is my inspiration and has always been my hero. Eileen is 10 years older than me and is an MS sufferer. She's a retired GP and still examined on behalf of the Royal College of GPs, a vital cog in ensuring that we have primary care doctors in the UK. She resides in England and although Eileen no longer drives, uh, she has uh, in her possession and has had since she was still driving a blue badge. She calls it my precious. So apologies to the Chamber, to Tolkien and Tandy Circus, but it is her precious. So why is it so important to her? Because it gives her independence. It gives her the ability to continue to go about her daily lives, to have been economically and socially independent, to continue to work and take a full part in society. It quite frankly has given her certainty in an uncertain work life. But, presiding officer, my sister has been lucky, um, and I am so frustrated at the number of representations I have made, often unsuccessfully, for MS sufferers who are rejected for blue badges because of the arbitrary criteria, which does not recognise the fluctuating symptoms from relapsing and remitting multiple sclerosis. And I thank David Torrance for 
talking about this in terms of the, of the, of the, the benefits we have coming here before. Um, a blue badge can be a lifeline to an MS sufferer that allows them to continue to work, to take a full part in society and to give them the confidence that they can go out knowing that they'll be able to get back home safely, knowing that if they do have a, a relapse or they feel unwell, that they can, they can get back home safely and easily. And it's so important, and I really want to, to make that plea, that we work on doing something to improve the understanding of MS amongst those that are deciding what support is available to sufferers. And that is why I thank again Dave Torrance and, and MS, both uh, uh, the MS um, charities who have supported today for their work in, in raising awareness and trying to, to ensure that everybody understands how difficult a condition this is and how important it is that MS sufferers get all the support they need to allow them to have the best life possible going forward. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Thank you, Ms Adamson. I now call Pam Duncan-Glancy to be followed by Liam McCarter. Up to four minutes, please, Ms Duncan-Glancy. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. I want to start by saying a huge thank you to the MS Society for organising this debate, and I see them here this evening, and for all they and other organisations do to advocate for people living with MS, and of course my colleague David Torrance for securing tonight's debate. Throughout the pandemic and in the face of the rising cost of living, service closures and systemic poverty and inequality faced by members, these organisations have given their all to stand up for their members, relentlessly fought for the realisation of their rights and made sure their voices were heard. They did so against a backdrop of uncertainty, the theme of this year's MS Week. They were uncertain of their own funding, meaning extra pressure on staff and inability to properly plan for the long term, uncertain of what was coming, uncertain of the twists and turns they'd have to navigate. As a disabled person myself, I know how it feels to live a life of uncertainty. Yet certainty um, is the one thing I, we, really need to ensure we enjoy our human rights on an equal basis to everyone else. We need practical assistance, as well as information, space and time. Without those things and a certainty for them, even on a good day, people are left without dignity, freedom, control and choice. In fact, when asked by the MS Society as part of their My MS My Needs survey, 67% of those responding said that they were scared and uncertain about the future. There are too many elements of their lives, of disabled people's lives and human rights, that remain uncertain. Social care remains piecemeal. Many who need it are still living without the basic care they need. People cannot get the adaptations they need and are dying on waiting lists, spending their last years in houses that are not suitable for them. Transport is inaccessible. Even the transport that is accessible needs more planning than for non-disabled people. If you want to get a train, you have to call for assistance. If you want to get on a bus, you need to hope that there's not another wheelchair user already on board. And if you want to ride on the Glasgow subway, well, tough. Last year, NASA announced that they're looking to put disabled people on the moon. Yet in my city, many disabled people cannot get from one side of the city to another. Deputy President Officer, on average, it costs people with MS between £600 and £1,000 more to live. Disabled people are unsure where they can make, whether they can make ends meet. That is why we need a properly functioning social security system that ensures people have the money they need. The Government should move quickly to address the adequacy and eligibility of disability benefits in Scotland and to assess the additional cost of being a disabled person, then uprate the disability benefits to match that. They must recognise that people's conditions, including MS, can fluctuate. There can be good and bad days. That is why the Scottish Labour Party stood alongside the MS Society to fight for the removal of the unfair 20 metre rule. Despite asking multiple times in committee, the Chamber and in letters to the Cabinet Secretary for a commitment to do this, we are as yet to get reassurance. This is yet more uncertainty and I would urge the Government to provide that certainty on this soon. People should not be worried that they are going to miss out on money they need. They should not be punished for having good days. We should celebrate people's good days and be there on the bad. Social security is just one way we can bring more certainty to people's lives, but it isn't the only way. We could restart care and respite services and ensure that unpaid carers get the breaks they need, giving people the certainty that they need around their care. We could pay care workers £15 an hour to show them their work is valued, make sure they stay in the profession and attract new people to it, providing certainty that there are carers there to give the support we need. And we could provide care free at the point of delivery, making sure that people had the certainty they need to know that they won't have to sell their home or spend their life savings just to afford care they cannot live without. Deputy Presiding Officer, this debate is about uncertainty, and as we've heard, there is far too much of that. But I want to finish by saying that amongst the uncertainty, one thing is always certain. Disabled people, people with MS and other organisations will never give up. 
They are resilient, but they shouldn't have to be. Scotland should just be better for all of us. Nevertheless, they, and so we, must persist in the fight for equality. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Duncan Glancy. I now call uh, Liam MacArthur to be followed by Paul McLennan. Up to four minutes, please, Mr MacArthur. Thank you, uh, President Officer. Can I join others in congratulating David Turns on stepping into the Dr Martin Hughes of George Adam uh, and stepping into one of his suits by the looks of things too. But um, <laughs> genuinely, I, I, I thank David Torrens uh, for making this debate possible uh, this evening and thank the MS Society, not just for the um, support that they provided in, in terms of briefings for this debate, but for the work, as Donald Cameron said, year-round in supporting the MS community. And I have long taken an interest in, in this issue, not through personal experience uh, myself, but because I uh, represent uh, the constituency with the highest level of uh, MS, uh, not just in Scotland, but anywhere in the world. Um, and as a result, I think in Orkney, it is a community that has been um, for a long time very supportive of those um, uh, with and affected by MS. This was evidenced um, in, the, in, in recent months by uh, young farmers whose um, bail art competition had a focus on MS this year, uh, and the uh, remarkable tractor run uh, organised by Graham Nicholson and Stephen Sinclair, which raised a phenomenal amount of money uh, for MS, as well as a couple of other uh, local charities. But beyond that, we have an MS therapy centre that is, is um, greatly valued uh, by the MS community. We are fortunate in having an MS nurse uh, in the wonderful Moira Flett. Uh, who was the subject of previous debates where there was the focus on the, the work that MS nurses do. And I think, generally speaking, while there's a great deal more to do, we feel broadly um, fortunate in Orkney in terms of the support that is uh, available. Uh, in terms of, of um, previous debates, uh, a focus uh, in one of uh, the earlier debates I took part in was uh, research. It's mentioned in, in David Torrance's motion this time round. Uh, and while uh, I think Donald Cameron was right to talk about the progress that's made in recent years in terms of the approval of treatments, there's a long way uh, still to go. But I think we can draw confidence from the fact that here in Scotland um, in particular, we're seeing world-leading research being taken forward uh, by our universities and research institutes, including by individuals like Professor Jim Wilson uh, at uh, Edinburgh University himself, uh, an Arcadian. And this, I think, gives us uh, hope for the, the future. But again, I think David Torrance was right to draw on the individual nature of this condition, not just between individuals, but on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis for each and, and every uh, individual. Um, the, uh, the, the theme of my, my MS, my life, again, was uh, reflected in, in, in previous debates. But I remember attending a, a, a reception that coincided with a, an earlier debate and talking to my constituent, Alan Jameson, who talked about the importance of providing opportunities for those affected by MS to gather, to share experience, um, to, to, to feel the companionship. And I think as a result of the, uh, um, the, the pandemic, that has, of course, been far more difficult. And that risk of isolation has, I think, been felt acutely by those in the uh, MS community. I know in, in, in Orkney, a very popular watercolour class that was run uh, previously moved into the online uh, arena. The, the classes were held in Zoom. They've now produced cards and indeed a, a, a book of, of, of watercolours that are accompanied by prose um, produced by P6 and 7 pupils from the, the whole primary school, evidencing what can be done. But it is such a relief that we're now seeing some of those uh, opportunities, those activities um, being re-established and starting up again in practice as they are so important. And in that line, I'm looking forward to making a reappearance uh, with the Scottish Ballet uh, at the end of this week as they take forward workshops in Orkney, hopefully presaging um, a point where local das dance practitioners, musicians and volunteers can help provide those sorts of classes, recognising the importance of physical movement and mobility to not just the physical health of those uh, with MS, but the mental health as well. But on an optimistic um, note, I note in the, the briefing from uh, MS Society, this is, it quotes one individual saying, my attitude is that nobody's got certainty so just live your life to the fullest because you don't know what's around the corner. I think that is an important me message to convey. It reflects very much the attitude of my constituent, Hayley Budge, uh, who has announced that she's just about to embark on a flying scholarship uh, and demonstrating that, as ever, she continues to take life uh, by the horns. Uh, but I thank David Torrance again for allowing the Parliament to have this annual uh, debate. Look forward to, uh, to further debates in future and more progress in the years to come. Thank you.
Thank you, Ms McArthur. I now call Paul McLennan to be followed by Gillian Mackay. Up to four minutes, please, Mr McLennan. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. Can I also thank David Torrance for bringing forward this member's debate this evening. The theme of MS Awareness Week this year is uncertainty, and uncertainty has been with us more than, than ever in the past few years. COVID, the war in Ukraine, the cost of living crisis. MS, as we all know, can be very uncertain for everyone living with it. It is a condition where people have good days and bad and when and if how symptoms might change, how their condition might progress, or whether their treatments will continue to work. In 2019, my MS, my needs survey revealed that, 40 that only 40 per cent felt confident they would be able to overcome the challenges that MS may bring them in the future. In the most recent survey carried out ahead of MS Awareness Week, 67 per cent of respondents living with MS said they were scared and uncertain about their future. As has been referred to already, Scotland has one of the highest rates of MS anywhere in the world. Over 15,000 people are living with MS in Scotland. Most people are diagnosed with relapsing, remitting MS. This is where symptoms suddenly get worse due to relapses and then gradually improve. Over time, many people diagnosed with relapsing MS will develop secondary progressive MS. They will stop getting relapses, but their disability will steadily get worse. Just 20 years ago, and I think Donald Cameron mentioned it, but they, um, there were no treatments available to halt the progression of uh, MS. Thanks to the work of researchers in MS, community mobilised to fund them. There are now 17 disease-modifying therapies approved in Scotland to treat MS. These treatments can help minimise the severity and frequency of MS relapses, thus slowing the progression of the disease. Uncertainty can that be exacerbated by a social security system that does not guarantee adequate support, stretched health services and a rising cost of living that will have a greater impact on disabled people more than others. Across Scotland, local MS uh, uh, groups work tirelessly for their community where they are supported and properly resourced, expert specialist immersion nurses and neurologists make an incredible difference to the lives of people living with MS. Lukey House, in my constituency, offers respite to MS sufferers and other long-term conditions and was previously an MS-run facility. Lukey House is now up at an independent charity but still offers services to those with MS. The pandemic has been a very uh, stressful and uncertain time for the MS community. Not only were people with MS more uh, vulnerable to COVID due to weakened immune systems brought on by the treatment, but services they relied upon were closed. In response to this, at the height of the lockdown in 2020, the MS Society co-designed the wellbeing hub to address their community's needs and to address service gaps, particularly in community-led services. The hub, funded by the Scottish Government uh, Neurological Framework Fund is person-centred. Though, though through work in partnership with MS professionals, it delivered online services that has been mentioned previously to enable support to a much wider audience, including those with poor mobility or other commitments. The hub builds on incremental innovation, adapting and improving as we gather information from the, the participants. And to date, over 1,100 uh, live stream sessions have been delivered to around about 750 participants. Before the pandemic, the MSSI estimated that the average person living with MS faced additional costs of between £600 to £1,000 per month, depending on the severity of their condition. And only this lunchtime at the Good Food event that some of us attended, I spoke to somebody who raised that particular point. Didn't have an MS, but had a disability, and of course that's really concerning. So I hope the minister will be able to pick up that in that regard, and also the point that, that Pam Duncan Glancy mentioned it as well. The constant uncertainty that surrounds those living with MS is never, is never certain as to whether a condition will progress or further stretch already limited resources. In a survey carried out by the MS Society, only 20 per cent of people living with MS told us that the government paid for all their care needs, on average they said, funded around about 75 per cent of their non-medical costs, including self-management activities and therapies. Now, these figures were taken from surveys before the pandemic and before the rise in the cost of living. We can surmise the scale of the issues outlined will only have grown. In conclusion, as parliamentarians, we need to ensure the ability to access financial support required matches the significant rises in the cost of living, and ensure that those with disabled people have the MS receive the financial support they need. Thank you. Thank you, Ms McLennan. I now call Gillian Mackay to be followed by Beatrice Wisher. Wisher. Beatrice Wisher will be the last speaker before I ask the Minister to respond. Up to four minutes, please, Ms Mackay. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I would also like to thank David Torrance for securing this debate today. Multiple sclerosis is a lifelong disease that is estimated to affect 2.8 million people across the globe and over 15,000 here in Scotland. The experience of living with MS is not always limited to having MS, but additional complications that come with the disease. These additional complications can be wide-ranging and include issue issues such as bladder and bowel issues, paralysis, alterations to people's mental state, 
including symptoms such as forgetfulness, depression and even epilepsy. The theme of this MS Awareness Week is uncertainty. I asked a very dear friend of mine if she would mind writing something about her experience with MS. She is a wonderful woman who will support anyone who needs it and never complains about how she is feeling. This is absolutely reflected in her thoughts, which I am pleased to be able to share in her words today. She says, Indeed, the biggest issue with MS is the uncertainty of everything. It usually takes years to get a proper diagnosis due to the fact that you would normally experience symptoms over time, which on their own would never point to MS. It is only when you start experiencing several symptoms together that you tend to get an MRI scan. Sometimes that can be inconclusive, but in my case the scarring was easily visible. When you are first told that you have MS, it is quite a devastating blow because there are no doctors or neurologists who can give you a roadmap of what you will experience. Every single person will experience something different and quite often have different symptoms at the onset. It is difficult to come to terms with the fact that you have no guarantee on how quickly it may progress. When I was first diagnosed, I was told that I had remitting, relapsing MS. In my mind, it was a case of seeing how long I was going to get between episodes. Each time you relapse, it is the uncertainty of how long it will last. As each week goes by, you know that there is less chance of regaining all the functionality that you had before the episode. In the earlier episodes, I was able to see an improvement after a few weeks, and then as the years went on, the symptoms of the relapse would linger for months. It got to the stage where, after a relapse, I never had any improvement, and I have now been diagnosed with secondary progressive MS. I feel incredibly lucky because I am still able to walk and can manage to still look after myself. But I find it difficult to plan things due to the uncertainty of the disease. I can feel reasonable one day and the next I am in so much pain that I am una unable to do anything. My sister had MS and she ended up in a wheelchair very quickly, so that is another reason to feel lucky. I would like to put on record again my thanks to my friend for giving me her comments. Just two decades ago, there were no treatments available to those who had MS. Now, thanks to all those involved in the MS community, from the NHS charities and dedicated researchers, there are now 17 disease-modifying therapies which have been approved in Scotland to treat various stages of MS. These treatments now range from addressing the severity and frequency of MS relapses, those who are already living with relapsing remitting MS, and more recently, treatments have been greenlit to treat secondary progressive MS, as we have heard tonight. Even before the pandemic, the MS Society estimated that those living with MS face costs of an additional £600 to £1,000 per month. Those living with MS face additional costs on accessing essential goods and services, such as paying for additional electricity to power assistive technologies and the requirement of higher heating bills to stay warm. On average, those living with an underlying and persisting health, persistent health condition like MS face living costs amount to the equivalent of half their income. I would like to thank the MS Society Scotland for the incredible work supporting those who live with MS, for their work to fund research and for representing the MS community across the political sphere and wider society. As parliamentarians, we must tackle these very prevalent challenges, especially with the cost of living crisis and the impacts of the COVID pandemic, and ensure that MS sufferers are provided the support they need to ensure the best quality of life. Thank you, Ms Mackay. I now call Peter Swishart up to four minutes, please, Ms Swishart. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and thank you to David Torrance for bringing this important debate to the Chamber today, and thank you for the MS charity for the work that, that uh, you do. Uh, uncertainty is the theme for this year's MS Awareness Week. Uncertainty often brings with it a sense of powerlessness, and that's what I'd like us all to consider when we try to find the means to support the lives of those living with multiple sclerosis. The Northern Isles have a high prevalence of MS, with uncertainty still as to just why this is the case. Why, for example, do some families have multiple members with MS? Why do places like New Zealand and Canada have high rates of MS too, both countries with descendants of Arcadians and Shetlanders who emigrated there decades ago? Orkney, as my um, or MSP colleague Liam MacArthur has pointed out, Orkney has the highest incidence of MS anywhere in the world. And Professor Jim Wilson from Orkney himself has, with his team at the University of Edinburgh, been carrying out world-leading work on the subject over many years. Research continues into why there is great prevalence and for new treatments and therapies. 
But we all look forward to the day when we can say we've found a way to stop MS. I note the 17 treatments available for MS in NHS Scotland, which is referenced in the motion. In 2019, a procedure which reboots an MS patient's system, halting the progress of MS, was hailed as a huge step forward and recommended for use on the NHS in Scotland. Some have received this treatment abroad, and those who have undergone the treatment have said that it has halted and restored some of what MS has affected. Treatment abroad, however, means costs. Those living with MS, as the MS Society briefing states, already spend between £600 and £1,000 additional costs per month. This could be for energy bills, goods, services, trying to stay warm. MS is unpredictable and offers much uncertainty as to how someone living with MS may feel at any given time. Perhaps it's feeling too warm in the height of winter other family members need the heating on, but only an electric fan can relieve MS symptoms. It may only be for 10 minutes, but there is, this racks up the electricity costs. Even having a shower can require, addition, require additions such as more towels. More towels create more washing, and more washing, more electricity. The MS Society briefing shows that only 20% of people living with MS have all their care needs met by the government. There are also costs that can't be managed, the emotional pressure, the additional asks of partners, the impact on family life. Getting help from government, such as PIP, often requires a walking test. What these tests don't measure is the long-term, changeable, fluctuating nature of MS. Walking any distance could feel much easier one day than the next. Appeals and bureaucracy contribute to the uncertainty and sense of powerlessness. The effort to overturn something you know to be unjust can be exhausting. A system has developed whereby people are forced through hoops of admin to survive. So with the uncertainty of MS comes a sense of powerlessness. We must address both and ensure that those living with MS and those around them feel supported. Support to ensure that they can ride the waves of uncertainty, feel empowered to speak out and have confidence that they will be heard. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you, Ms. Bishop. And I now call on Minister Marie Todd to respond to the debate. Up to seven minutes, please, Minister. Presiding Officer, I am really pleased to be able to respond on behalf of Government this afternoon as we mark MS Awareness Week. And I thank David Torrance for moving this important motion. As my colleagues have highlighted, Scotland has one of the highest incidences of MS, and as an MSP with a Highland constituency, I am particularly aware that the incident is incidence is greatest in our most northerly areas. I want to assure you that I am committed to ensuring that all people living in Scotland with multiple sclerosis are able to access the very best possible care and support. Late last year, I met with the MS Society to discuss the fi findings of their Neurology Now report and how we can work together to drive up standards of care across the country. It is clear that working in partnership will help us to ensure we focus on what matters most to people with MS. And whilst 20 years ago there were no treatments available for MS, we now have 17 in Scotland. And this progress is thanks in no small part to the amazing work of researchers and MS charities. And today I want to pay tribute to their committed efforts to find more and better treatments for this devastating condition and to support those affected by it. Certainly. Liam MacArthur. I am very grateful to the Minister for taking intervention. She is right to point to the developments that have been in, in treatments. Um, but sitting alongside that, it would have to be the, a recognition of the importance that MS nurses have, have uh, played and continue to play. Um, I, I know I referenced uh, Moira Flett in my own um, uh, speech, but there is a fragility to this, and that I think what the, the MS community would wish to see is a, is a reassurance about the succession planning, so that future MS nurses, a pipeline of those nurses, um, is on the way in order to fill the gaps that inevitably uh, will appear uh, in the years ahead. Minister. So I um, absolutely agree, and I'm keen to work with MS charities and with people with a special interest in this, with the folk um, in the neurology um, uh, 
task force, and I'm sorry, I've forgotten the name of that particular group, but with their neurology team at the, in the Scottish Government to make sure that there is a resilience. We've seen in certain geographical areas in Scotland just recently that there is um, a, a, an issue with these particularly specialised um, roles being dependent on maybe just one individual. And when that one individual isn't available, it can really devastate the service that's um, being delivered. So desperately keen to make sure that we have resilient and sustainable services right throughout Scotland. Um, and as I say, I'm not unaware of the issues in the far north. Uh, where we have the highest incidence, but also have a sparse population and challenging times delivering public services. So I am keen to work closely with um, everyone who has an interest in making sure that we provide a sustainable service going forward. Um, despite the disruption to health and social care services during the pandemic, we have sustained our efforts to deliver the commitments of our neurological care and support framework. And that framework is designed to ensure that everyone with a neurological condition, including MS, can access the care and support they need to live well on their own terms. And despite the pressure on Scottish Government priorities, the focus on funding for the framework has been maintained. This year, we're continuing to implement this as a priority, with £1 million commissioned for work to improve neurological care across Scotland. And over the past 18 months, we've invested more than £300,000 in projects to specifically improve the health and well-being of people in, with MS in Scotland. So, to pick up on my colleague um, Mr Cameron's point, while the NHS, NHS recovery plan is not condition specific, the aim is to affect whole system recovery and support prioritisation and planning. And in that respect, we would expect this to directly affect neurological services and the experiences and outcomes for people with neurological conditions such as MS. I'm delighted that through the neurological framework we have been able to fund three new projects to deliver mental, physical and social support to people affected by MS and test models of preventative, rehabilitative and palliative care. And that includes the MS Society's Wellbeing Hub, hub which has helped over 750 people with vital one-to-one -one support such as counselling and physiotherapy, as well as providing group and social activities. With regard to MS nursing, we do understand the invaluable care and support that is delivered by Scotland's MS nurses, and I want to recognise and commend their commitment to maintaining high levels of patient support during the pandemic. The Scottish MS Register's 2021 report noted that despite the challenges presented by COVID, 87 per cent of newly diagnosed people received contact with an MS specialist nurse within 10 working days of diagnosis and over 99% of people were contacted within 10 working days of an MS nurse receiving the referral. I mean, that's really astounding to be able to maintain that level of service when we're facing so many challenges on so many fronts. Colleagues have spoken today about the additional financial challenges facing people with disabilities as they experience the impacts of the rising cost of living. And the Scottish Government has taken a range of actions to help people facing the combined pressures of higher energy bills, the increased cost of their weekly shop, as well as the UK Government's national insurance hike and interest rate, rate rises. I can assure you we are doing all that we can within our powers to help those who are worst affected, including those people with serious health conditions. For example, we're stepping up our investment to accelerate deployment of heat and energy efficiency measures and to support those who are least able to pay, allocating at least £1.8 billion over the course of this Parliament. We've recently allocated a further £10 million to our fuel and security fund. Another example of action that we're taking um, to help with financial pressures is making social security support for people with MS more straightforward to access. We've replaced the adversarial approach of the DWP by removing assessments and degrading examinations. And through the introduction of the adult disability payment, we're providing new, simplified and compassionate systems that will treat people with dignity and with respect. Certainly. More than happy. I thank the Minister for taking this intervention. Can I ask the Minister what their view is on the 20 metre rule? Minister. So we're undertaking an independent review in that and applying. We are, as it currently operates, we're applying um, 
different eligibility criteria to ensure that the 20 metre rule is applied fairly. Um, and the changes will mean that Social Security will make, um, Scotland will make more accurate and consistent decisions on mobility, resulting in a more dignified experience for folk with MS. But we are un undertaking an independent review in that. I'm more than happy to keep the member informed on progress on that front. Continuing research, as many have said, is absolutely critical to better understanding and improvement of treatment of MS. And I want to pay tribute to the medical research community working in this area. The outcomes of the new research and trial can be groundbreaking. And I'm delighted that we've awarded one, around 1.9 million through the Scottish Government's Chief Scientist Office to support a major four-year research project led by NHS Lothian and the University of Edinburgh. The aim is to develop a new approach to guide the treatment of MS and to help people have better control of their condition. In addition, we have awarded 360,000 in recent years to fund five PhD students, um, research studentships in MS at Scottish universities, part of a programme to increase research in neurodegenerative conditions. Presiding officer, I want to close this debate by thanking those who have shared their stories and their experiences and their contributions today. I also want to recognise the dedication of those impacted by MS, the professionals involved in their care and the MS Research Committee, who are all working with us to make a difference. And, of course, I want to commend the tireless commitment of Scotland's MS charities in improving the quality of life of those they support. The ongoing progress around MS further speaks to the value of cross-party working, and I very much look forward to attending the Joint MS and Epilepsy Cross-Party Group Meeting um, next in June to explore further the next steps that we can take together. Looking to the future, I can absolutely assure the Chamber that as a government we will continue to work with partners right across health, social care, welfare and housing to enact transformational change and to improve the quality of life and outcomes for people with neurological conditions like MS. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. That concludes the debate, and I close this meeting.